Good evening. It is time for us to begin. If you would grab a songbook, turn to number 714. 714. We do have a few announcements and prayer requests that we need to mention this evening. Uh, there's going to be a church camp meeting this Saturday morning at 10 o'clock here at the building. It is crazy to think that Taylor Christian Camp is already uh, just around the corner. Uh, so we're going to begin planning at that this Saturday. There's going to be a youth movie night and scavenger hunt Sunday night following services. Uh, if you are 10 and under, please tell your parents to come with you. Uh, but anyone over 10, uh, cutoff age would be 18, 19, 20, around there. Uh, but plan on coming to that. This Sunday night, we're going to be having a uh, movie and scavenger hunt. It's also going to be a CYC meeting this Sunday morning following services. So if you're planning on attending that, please uh, go to the meeting. Some exciting news. Daryl and Terry are proud grandparents again. BJ and uh, Emily had Joanna Morgan on Monday. Uh, they came home today. Everyone is doing good, so be sure to congratulate them. Uh, also, we are collecting money for BJ and Emily, uh, and you can see Terry uh, to give to that. Emily, uh, my wife Emily, needs to meet with the women briefly after services. Uh, I believe she will, uh, has some things to discuss about the ladies' day after services tonight. We have uh, food donations in the fellowship hall from Food Lion. If you know of anyone that needs food or if you yourself are in need of food, uh, you can go to uh, the kitchen in the back after services tonight to see if there's anything that you could use. Also concerning the Sweetheart Banquet that is uh, coming up in March, it will be $15 a plate, so $30 a couple for the food. And March 5th is the deadline if you are wishing to sign up for that. Any other announcements or prayer requests that we need to mention this evening? Yes, sir. I 
Carson Hernandez. Okay. <clears throat> so be praying for the Hernandez family. Okay. Any other prayer requests that we need to mention? If you have your Bibles, open up to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Paul says, beginning in verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus... You who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Before we encountered Christ and the blessings that came through his sacrifice, we were considered far off, meaning there was no relationship, there was no connection with God. But after Christ came into the picture, after he died on the cross, we we're able to be brought near to Christ. Our before picture was that of separation from God, but the blood of Christ was redemptive. Look at verse 14. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, says, For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. It is through Christ that we have both our access in one spirit to the Father, verse 18. And so through Christ, all of mankind is able to be reconciled to God and find unity with God. We are reconciled through the blood of Christ. That is the fundamental basis of our entire existence as Christians, that we have been saved, we have been redeemed, we have been reconciled, we have been brought near. Through the blood of Christ. So what does this mean for you tonight? Well, if you have been immersed into Christ, you are redeemed and sealed by the Holy Spirit, meaning God sees you as his child. If you are a Christian, you have obeyed what God has called for us to do. We are constantly in connection with the Father. If you have been immersed, you are constantly tied to the creator of this world. We must completely separate ourselves from our before picture, what we were before Christ. Because before we are far off, but now in Christ we are brought near, which means we can no longer associate with who we were before. The bad habits, the sins, we are no longer defined by these things. But this happens through constant dwelling in the word of Christ, through a consistent prayer life and understanding what Christ's blood has done for us. If we always focus on our relationship with Christ, we will slowly get further from our old self and draw closer to our God. But the closer we come to Christ, the harder Satan is going to try to pull us away. And sadly, what happens is many Christians get caught up, even though they've been called away from their old self, with habits that used to define them. And here we are sitting in a relationship with God, being able to call him our father, and yet we're still being pulled away by our temptation, our desires. And so this evening, I encourage you, don't focus on your old self. Think about what Christ has done for you, how he has tied us together with the father. Dwell on that thought, dwell on his word and pray to this God that has given so much for us. It could be that you're here this evening. And you recognize that you have been pulled away from your new creation in Christ. That Satan has pulled you away. And I encourage you, ask for the prayers of the congregation. Because as a family, we have been united, as we see in verses 14 through 16, through what Christ has done. And we encourage one another. But it could be that maybe you're still living a life of sin. You're still tied to that old self and you wish to put it off this evening. I encourage you, make the best decision you could ever make and be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins right now as we stand and as we sing. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory.
Good evening. A couple weeks ago, we started a class focused on a discussion with the naturalistic person. Evolution has, as we mentioned before, really crept into many uh, of our educational systems, and people are taught evolution as fact. And this is clearly uh, not good, according to uh, Scripture, especially the fact that people have begun to replace God's Word with what modern man has decided to come up with. On the first study that we did, we looked at the necessary planks of cosmic evolution. I will give you $100 if you can name me what those planks of cosmic evolution are. They're the fundamental basis. Someone tell me what cosmic evolution is. Okay, okay, so that's why I used that example, right? From a rock to a human. See, it works, doesn't it? Okay. Cosmic evolution means coming from a rock to a human. That's exactly right, okay? Cosmic evolution is the idea that uh, the cosmos, that is the world, came from a single uh, organism that evolved and evolved and changed and morphed and eventually made what we have here today. So the planks of cosmic evolution, the universe, number one, spontaneously generated or is eternal. Number two, life spontaneously generated from non-life. Number three, macroevolution is true and accounts for the existence of different kinds of animals. 
Number four, neo-Darwinianism is the mechanism for the evolution of complex kind from simple primordial organisms. Number five, humans and apes have a common ancestor. Number six, human uniformitarianism is true. And number seven, the earth is very old. That is the basis of our class and this series is we're going to go through each one of these planks and disprove every single one. Now, we started uh, last week or two weeks ago, rather, looking at the first plank, which is matter or energy spontaneously generated or is eternal. Can anyone remember anything from that class? We weren't from rocks, okay? Does anyone remember my... Uh... Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. That is the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, so the scientific law that is the first law is energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Now... Why is this important when it comes to dismantling evolution? Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It has always been, and we need to trace it back to its origin. Now, people will try and trace everything that they see around us, the energy that is neither created nor destroyed, Back to nature, a natural cause, which is what they say is the Big Bang. There was a small period like dot that exploded with tons of force and it created everything that we see around us today. Kind of going back to the rock. We came from a rock and we turned into humans from that rock. So energy can either be created nor destroyed. My brother Gary is here. He really likes cars. In uh, an internal combustion engine. How does that show the first law of thermodynamics? In an internal combustion engine, what happens? Just explain the process. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, and what happens to the car? Okay, it goes forward if it's in gear, and if it's not in gear, you rev it up, and you're dumping a bunch of energy in the form of gasoline that is being combusted and ignited, shoving the pistons down, which turns the car and the blank and all the parts on it. Gary, I apologize. You make me nervous. But you have all of this that happens in a car, internal combustion engine. You have energy. Now, it is destroyed in a sense. The gasoline is ignited, but it actually just changes into what? Exhaust. And is a car engine hot? Yes, and heat. So the energy isn't destroyed, rather it changes forms. And so that's very important when it comes to understanding creation. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. We cannot make energy. So how did nature itself create itself? Where did the energy come from? How was it created? So first law, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. What was the second law that we looked at? Second law of thermodynamics. Remember the, the clock, the ticking thing. <laughs> That's why I use the illustrations. And we have more tonight too. Okay, Leonardo da Vinci's clock. You know how it worked? I put some quarters in a weighted sack that had the string and I twisted it up. And it kept time because the weight was pulling on it. What happens when the string reaches the bottom? You have to wind it back up in order for it to keep going. Second law of thermodynamics. Everything tends towards disorder. Remember the Corvette that I mentioned from the National Corvette Museum? That was bought brand new, put behind a wall, sealed off with cement wasn't touched, wasn't driven, wasn't exposed to sunlight or rain or anything. And 50 years later, they broke the car back out, and what did it look like? We saw it. It's pretty dusty. It's pretty old. It would not start. You know why? Second law of thermodynamics, everything tends towards disorder. Any questions or comments on the first and second law? 
Now, why is the second law important when it comes to dismantling evolution? Okay. This is what the second law of thermodynamics says. Everything is slowly decaying. You know what evolution says? Everything is evolving, growing, and changing. In order for evolution to be correct, you would have to take the second law of thermodynamics and say, we don't need you. Because it's not decaying. Rather, over millions of years of time, what happened? Things got better, didn't they? Got more complex. And so the second law of thermodynamics, everything tends towards disorder, does not fit with evolution. So let's begin this evening uh, looking at the third plank of evolution. Let's, uh, any questions or comments, though, so far? Any confusion? It's okay to say yes. Okay, good. All right, we're going to move on then. So in our conclusion in the first plank that we looked at, only three options for the origin of the universe are available. Does anyone remember what those three possible ways that our universe could have existed? Spontaneous generation, okay, which we would also call the Big Bang. What's the second? It was eternal. It's always been here. What's the third? Special creation. Which one do we believe makes the most sense according to the laws of science, first and second law of thermodynamics so far? Special creation, correct? Okay. So let's look at the second plank. Life spontaneously generated from non-life. Uh, George Wald, I don't know if any of you are familiar with him. He was a very well-known atheist, wrote a book called The Origin of Life, Scientific America. And notice what he says on page 48. Talking about evolution, time is the hero of the plot. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible becomes probable, and the probable becomes virtually certain. One has only to wait. Time itself performs miracles. Anyone agree with that? It doesn't make sense. You know why? Because with time comes decay, second law of thermodynamics. However, when it comes to creation, when it comes to rather the world that they see around them, atheists will say, well, evolution is taking place, meaning that the world is continually changing and growing and forming. We're going to look at that more tonight. And the energy source that they claim uh, is from, uh, well, we'll get there in a second. Evolutionary theory starts with nothing and has no means of creating anything. And so they try to end up with everything from nothing. We looked at last week, events whose probabilities are zero are called impossible events. We mentioned one being a junkyard and a tornado going through it and creating what? A plane, a Boeing 747. Is that probable? Could that happen? Okay, so events that have a, a likely chance of happening that are close to zero, one in, in 10 with two billion zeros behind it, those are never going to happen. That's actually called uh, Kolmogorov's first axiom. Uh, events whose probabilities are zeroed are called impossible events. They're not going to happen. When we look at evolution and the chances that it would take for these things to fall in line and, and actually form life and intelligent life at that uh, it's impossible. Evolution needs many things to happen in order for it to be true. It's not a matter, matter of probability, but impossibility. Evolutionists don't have enough time. And they say, give us enough time and you're going to find life. But going back to that illustration of the rock, remember what I said? This rock, if I held it here for a million years, what would it, what would it look like? A rock. Two million years. What's going to happen? Okay, well, let me change it up a little bit tonight. I brought my rock. But this time, I brought a lighter. 
If I put this lighter to this rock and I burn it for a thousand years, what's going to happen? Not much with this lighter. Okay. Anything cool going to happen? Anything going to change about this rock? What? It's not going to happen, right? It's just going to get hot. This is going to run out of gas. Eventually, maybe it'll start to change from the heat that's put on it. But will that ever, you can see how it's a little black there. Will this ever turn into anything other than a rock? Why not? Why is it this way? How come that rock's not going to change when I put a lighter to it? Okay, God created the rock. You know what evolutionists say? And I, and I showed you that lighter for a reason. They say, okay, well, maybe uh, some things won't just happen by chance, like the rock turning into something miraculous. You know what they say? The sun is a source of energy. That energy is placed onto this earth and begins to create life and energy. Is that possible? What's that? Okay. Okay, that's exactly right. Going back to the second law, or the first law rather, whenever you take the sun, you introduce this energy, it will be, it'll heat things up. You go out to the sun and you don't have any sunscreen on, you know what's going to happen to your skin? It's going to burn. But you take that energy and you dump it into something, it's still just going to be wasted energy. Uh, for example, let me get someone to rip this piece of paper. You go, Megan, rip this piece of paper for me. Okay, do it again. Is that hard? Okay, do it again. Okay, that's good. You can stop there. Did it take energy to rip that piece of paper? Okay. Did you make anything when you were ripping that? Or were you just tearing it? Okay. Just because there's energy involved, is it going to make something? You can turn on your oven and you can shove a bunch of random ingredients and turn it on 350. You going to make something? Maybe by chance. And that's what evolution say. You take the right amount of energy, the right circumstances, the right material, and guess what? You're going to create something. That energy that you use to rip this paper yeah, you dumped it, you wasted it, and the, the cause or whatever happened from that energy being used was just chaos, correct? There has to be order involved with the energy. So Jesus, whenever uh, he came down to this earth and he was teaching, do you remember what he said about his father? Let's see if I can find the verse here. Look at Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4 very quickly, and we'll skip back over to Jesus' ministry. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4. We looked at this the first night. Is this uh, Mike having some feedback problems? It's giving me a headache. Is that better? Still, still happening? Let me uh, change this one. I want to read Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4. Every house is built by someone, but God built them with everything. Okay. When it comes to, is that better? No feedback? Okay, good. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4 says that every house is built by someone. If you took the materials to make a house, and then you took a grenade and you lit it off underneath the materials, is that going to display some energy? Yes. Is it going to create something complex? It's not. Evolutionists say that when it comes to our world, everything that we see was caused by a random impact of, of different particles and material, an explosion that created something complex. 
The chances of that happening are impossible. And yet, whenever we look at scripture, God's word, Genesis chapter one and verse one, who created the world? God. And it took a creator to make something complex. But evolution says that that is not something that they believe to be possible. Any questions or comments so far? Evolutionists say that given enough time, they can make, or rather evolution, can create something that is complex. But no matter how much energy, no matter how much time, you are still going to need a designer. And that is as simple as we can put it. Anyone familiar with the law of biogenesis? Did you learn about it in school? Sound familiar? The law of biogenesis is that in nature, life comes only from life of its kind. Brian, you're familiar with cattle, right? You ever get a zebra from one of your cows? You ever walk out there and have a pregnant cow give birth to a dog? What usually happens? Or every time it happens? You have a calf still in the same family. Might be a different color, maybe. Might have a little bit different traits, but guess what? That calf is only going to come from a cow. That cow can only produce after its own kind. That's a law. That's why whenever a dog gives birth, it's going to give birth to more dogs. When a cow gives birth, it's going to give birth to more cows. And that is what we see in the animal kingdom. That's the law of biogenesis. In nature, life only comes from life of its own kind. You can demonstrate in a lab that life cannot come from non-life. But you cannot demonstrate in a lab that life can come from non-life. There has to be life in the first place. You have to have the cow in order to have the calf. Evolution says, well, non-life can create life. And then once that life is formed, that kind can produce a different kind. Basically, an invertebrate can become a vertebrate. A rock can become a human. The law of biogenesis clearly states that life comes from only life of its own kind. The problem is not just life coming into existence, however. It's that life coming into existence with the ability to reproduce is impossible. And evolution says, well, we were able to explain through nature that there was an explosion, there was energy, there was chaos for a second, but then it all formed into our universe around us and it created life that was able to reproduce. That life has to be able to be preloaded with genetic information to take in nutrients, to self-repair, to self-replicate, and so on. God's design is complex. God, when he created the animal kingdom, gave it all the inf information necessary to continue to reproduce. Evolution concerns itself only with the change of existing life. It doesn't talk about the introduction of that life. It doesn't have any concern for where the material came from, where the life came from. Rather, they just look at what has already been in place through the laws of nature, through the animal kingdom. And they say, look at all the changes that we've seen throughout the years. They never look at where the original material come from. I think, Jimmy, you said in our first class, whenever we brought up the Big Bang, you said, where did the material come from for the Big Bang? People aren't going to, especially in this field of science, they're not going to be too concerned about that. In fact, Richard Hawkins, Richard Dawkins rather, said that it's possible to find evidence of design in our genetics from some higher intelligence. Do you know what higher intelligence Richard Dawkins was talking about? Aliens. Aliens. That is this idea of directed panspermia. That is the idea that life was planted on earth millions of years ago by who? Guess what? Extraterrestrials. You know why they've come to that point? Go ahead. Where did they come from? You know, all they're doing is shifting the problem from our universe to a distant universe and still not answering the fact of cable with it. Where did the aliens come from? You know why the idea of directed panspermia came into place? 
because evolutionists sat down and they said, you know, we still have a problem. We've looked at all of the evolution uh, of its kind, abiogenesis, the morphing of kinds and different kinds, but we still have a problem. We trace it back to the beginning, and guess what? We still have no answer. Where did the material come from? Where did the aliens come from? Where did all of the things that created the Big Bang, where did those come from as well? And so Richard, Richard Dawkins says that the intelligent design of the human race came from a higher intelligence. Now, of course, it's not God. It's aliens. Even the aliens couldn't have popped into existence. Evolutionists just pushed the problem to a different planet, and that is blind faith. The probability of abiogenesis is so improbable. And again, abiogenesis is kinds coming from a different kind, evolutionary theory. The probability of abiogenesis is so improbable that by all accounts, especially by the account of the laws of probability, it is impossible. It's not going to happen. Belief in abiogenesis directly contradicts the law of biogenesis, which is kind from its own kind. But we also see that the attempts to explain how life could have risen on earth by natural means is supported by zero evidence. And when it does come to that point, they say aliens. Any questions or comments so far? Yeah. Well, one of the things that all of these scientists like to say in almost every case where they're not believing in God, is I'm a scientist, I believe in facts, I believe in what I can see, I believe in what I can prove. And yet, these scientists who say that want to pull aliens out of the air to explain intelligent design. You know, well, it's also interesting that the same way that this, this will argue between the theory and the law. You know, because the main yeah. difference between theory and the law is that the law is. 100% proven science. Yeah. So the theory of evolution, you know, you can't prove the theory of evolution. You'll never be able to be proved because it is not a law. There's no law by now to be proved. You know, so that's that's another one. Is a, a theory never will become a law. A theory can become absolute. Absolute. Sorry, but a law never can. Yeah. Law happens every single time. It's like what you were saying. The same time comes from the same time. It's variable. That's a law. Same time. The, the first law of thermodynamics is a law because you can see it time and time again. You take an ice cube and you put it on a plate, you know what's going to happen to the ice cube? It's going to melt. Every single time you take an ice cube out and it's not cold outside, you take that ice cube out, you set it on the counter, you set it on a plate, it is going to melt because the first law of thermodynamics is a law, not a theory. Evolutionary theory has so many holes in it that you cannot call it a law because there's not enough facts to support this theory. Whenever we're looking at, and I'm glad you brought that up, this idea that whenever it comes to evolution, you have to have a lot of faith in something. And you have people like Richard Dawkins saying, well, aliens. And then they turn around and they say, y'all are completely insane to believe in a God. But by the way, aliens, they, they left some very intelligent life on this planet millions of years, billions of years ago. At the end of the day, you just have to believe in a higher power of some sort when it comes to the beginning, the origin of our universe. People, uh, the evolutionary theory believe uh, that when it comes to abiogenesis, that is a more probable answer. That is that life of different kinds evolved and changed over the years, no matter what kind it was. They still believe that abiogenesis is rational. I'm here to say I don't think it's rational. It doesn't make sense. Because I've never seen a dog come from a cow. And when we look back at our Earth's history of everything that we've seen, we have never found any species that will give birth to something other than its own kind. Any other questions or comments? I want to look at, for the remainder of our time, I want to look at macroevolution. That is, that, and this is the third plank of the uh, evolutionist theory. All life, alive or extinct, is related, having evolved from a single-celled organism billions of years ago. That is a belief that evolution teaches. And again, that goes back to the illustration of the rock. All kinds 
originally came from one singular species, and everyone is related. The problem with that is the law of biogenesis. We've already discussed that. One kind of life is going to produce another kind of life. Uh, it is not going to happen. That goes against the laws. Stephen, as you said, this is proven by science, and they even agree with the first law of thermodynamics. It's not a possibility. The law of biogenesis keeps things like this from taking place. There's how many of you have ever heard of uh, vestigial organs? You ever heard of that? I want to spend some time looking at vestigial organs because what happens is you have people in the scientific community that believe in evolution. They say because of ev uh, evolution and how we've evolved and changed and become greater and stronger and better, uh, we now have parts to each animal kingdom and each species that is no longer needed. Vestigial organs is one of them that they talk about in humans. Yeah, that's one of them. We're actually going to talk about that in just a minute. Uh, Jake was telling me, Jake Miller, that he had his appendix removed 20-something years ago. And uh, ever since he had his appendix removed, guess what he's struggled with? Acid reflux. Very interesting. For the longest time, a vestigial organ in a human was known as something that's it's left over from evolution. It's just a uh, you've gone through the process. Your body doesn't need it anymore. That's from something that was needed millions of years ago, but now today you don't need it. And so it's something that's not useful in your body, uh, and they're leftovers from our ancestors, the product of evolution. Uh, the problem is these things that we have called uh, vestigial, that is useless, that we don't need, turns out they're actually pretty important. The appendix, the one that you mentioned and the one that Jake had removed, uh, is now known to help the immune system of children, and also it replenishes good bacteria after you've been sick. Does that sound useless? Does that sound like a product of evolution? It's leftovers from a previous generation? How many of you have ever had your tonsils removed? I'm sorry, but what I'm about to say is, is probably going to come as a shock here. For a long time, tonsils were seen as vestigial, that is useless, that you don't need them. They were from a different time period. Tonsils are known to help us fight germs. Didn't realize that until recently. In fact, scientists as a whole said, oh, yeah, you don't want your tonsils good enough. You need to have them removed. Go ahead. They're useless. Turns out they're not. The tailbone was once seen as a vestigial organ. It's actually pretty important. You know why? Because it's a point of attachment for several muscles in the pelvis. If you didn't have a tailbone, you'd have a very hard time walking. Now, we believed, evolutionists rather, believed that they were useless because of uh, a past that humans had that is actually not true. Someone tell me, why do we have hair on our skin? Why do we have hair on our skin? Is that important? Okay, why is it important? Okay, helps with sweating. Okay. Could you live without hair? I'm, I'm starting to learn that you can. <laughs> you know that scientists have found that people that have less hair on their head, and I'm allowed to say this because, you know, it's starting to go away. It's about to leave. Uh, people that have less hair on their head are more prone to getting skin cancer on their head. Do you know that? Why is that? Protects the skin. I had my first dome burn this past summer. It's terrible. You got to put sunscreen on your head now. But you know why that hair is there? Helps you to keep uh, from getting skin cancer. Hair on your skin protects your head uh, from the UV rays. And it's actually, scientists now understand that the hair on your skin, like the back of your neck, on your arms, is used as a warning system. Anyone have ever had the hair on the back of your neck stand up? Why does that happen? A sixth sense? Okay. We went to that uh, hayride with the teens. There was a part there. I'm going to admit the hair on the back of my neck stood up. You know why? Because I saw a clown and it was screaming and it had a chainsaw. I didn't need my hair to tell me that, you know, I was in danger. But guess what? It still stood up. 
Scientists have now discovered that the hair on your skin is actually used as a warning system. Another vestigial organ that people believe to be left over from the evolutionary process. Wisdom teeth. And they said, you don't like your wisdom teeth? Yeah, you, know, you don't need them. Turns out the uh, dental crowding is significantly affected by your diet. And it's actually more uncommon in primitive cultures. So when we look at our wisdom teeth at one point, and if you use them enough, you could actually have a benefit from those wisdom teeth. Now, everyone's teeth don't always come in straight. Mine didn't, sadly. But there is a purpose behind it. And people in the uh, scientific community that believe in evolution say that these used to be vestigial. They're no longer uh, needed by the body. Any questions or comments so far? Yep. Uh, half the time I'll say we know this happens, we're not sure why, especially in cycle literature with pharmaceuticals. You'll see we think it, it you know, antagonizes or agonizes the heat receptors, whatever, but we're not sure. Almost all of the time you're looking at what they're saying, we know this happens, we don't know why. Part of the scientific method is just following the evidence where it needs and not taking conclusions prematurely. And a lot of times, what confuses me about the whole vestigial organ thing is we still don't fully understand. Bodies. Yep. Peer reviewed published literature commonly has great dislike. We're not sure why this happens, but we know mm -hmm. it does. No, that's exactly right. And then those same people that say we don't know why this happens, they turn around and say, but we do know why uh, we don't need these anymore. You want to lose a few ounces? Sure, get that appendix out of there. We don't really fully understand the human body because we are not the creator. We're the created, and we discover these things. And, and actually, for the longest time, I mentioned. A couple weeks ago, they used to assign pregnant women uh, methamphetamines to help out with the uh, pain of pregnancy. Turns out that's not such a good idea. It used to have asbestos and kids' toys. We didn't recognize and understand all this and how the human body worked, but now we begin to understand, and then we're starting to say, okay, God is not in the picture. It doesn't make sense. Aliens make sense. The fact that we all came from a single kind, we're all related, and that the evolutionary process has left unusable organs that you don't need in your body, that makes sense. But then we study and we understand further. We make a new discovery on the human body and we say, well, actually, the appendix is useful. Actually, wisdom teeth are needed. Actually, the hair on your head does something. But for the longest time, we thought that we understood the human body. Any other questions or comments? One of the biggest problems that I have with uh, this idea that we all have a common ancestor when it comes to evolution, which is, uh, again, uh, macroevolution, the third plank in the evolutionary theory is that all life, alive or extinct, is related, having evolved from a single-celled organism billions of years ago. One of the biggest problems that I have and that many people have in looking at this is the fossil record. If evolution is correct, then we should expect to see millions of transitional fossils. If a horse came from a whale, where are all the horses that have whale tails? You ever seen that picture before in the science book where it's explaining evolution in the process and it shows a horse that's half on land with a whale tail in the water? And people look at that and go, oh, wow, that's cool. Crazy to think about these uh, horses that used to have tails. You know what we have never found? A horse with a tail. We have no evidence of any transitional fossils, and yet there are many people that claim to have found them. Uh, we're not going to have time to look at that tonight, but evolutionists claim to make many discoveries that have all been disproven to date. But if evolution is correct, we should expect to see millions of fossils that are in between the two stages in the evolutionary process. If creation is correct, what we should expect is a notable absence of transitional fossils. You know what we have never found? A transitional fossil. Creation says that's because we didn't evolve from one species and we can't all trace back to the same origin. The Bible says God created animals. He created land and sea animals, fish, birds, reptiles, Created them all in their own kind. 
And that's why whenever we find fossils, we find zero transitional fossils. Macroevolution violates the law of biogenesis. Someone tell me again, what is the law of biogenesis? Life only comes from life of its own kind. If you need a way to uh, remember that, whenever you were born, you came from a female human. Kind of a, a phrase that you wouldn't want to say in today's culture, but it's true. Every person that is here tonight came from a female human. By design. And so, whenever we're looking at the law of biogenesis, it states, guess what? You came from a female human. And there is no getting around this fact because God created us that way. I'm sure you're wondering why the bingo numbers are there behind me on the board. It's because those aren't bingo numbers. I was told afterwards it's what it looks like. That's not what it is. Uh, Neo-Darwinianism. That's a hard one is the belief that natural selection and genetic mutations will allow macroevolution to occur. Someone tell me, what is natural selection? Get behind the wheel of a car and not having a valid driving license. Natural selection, true or false? What happens if you, and I hate to say it this way, what happens if you are really, really dumb in life and you make really dumb decisions? What happens? Life will be taken away from you because of your decisions. Okay? Anyone believe in natural selection? Okay. Let me explain it this way and then we'll see. I hate to get into this with just eight minutes left, but here's what we're going to do. I am going to use these numbers on the board. You can forget about these triangles here. Natural selection tells us this, if I can explain it in a very simple way. Number 35 is the highest, therefore it is the greatest. Okay? 35 is the greatest. Is 29 less than 35? Okay. We're going to erase it. What about 25? Less than 35? Okay. We're going to erase it. What about 22? Okay. I guess I can just go ahead and erase all this. All of this is less than 35, which leaves what? 35. Natural selection in the evolutionary theory is that uh, organisms that are well-suited for their environment are more likely to survive, pass on their genetics to the next generation. It has no creative power, only that the greatest and strongest and best will survive. Do you see any problems with that? How many numbers did we have on the board before? Did anyone count? There were 10 numbers. But now that 35 has beaten all other numbers, how many are left? One number on the board. Natural selection is like a game of poker. If natural selection were a game of poker, it would be able to identify which sets of cards were favored and which were not. And so each round that you played a poker, you got rid of all the weak cards. What would you have at the end? A bunch of really good hands. But what's the problem? You've gotten rid of well over half of your deck. If this happened, if this took place in the different species on earth, would we have any left today? No. We would have... One species that was far greater that took over every other species and left the one standing. What would happen to the one that was standing? Well, it would die off eventually. Whenever we're looking at natural selection, it may be able to explain the survival of the fittest to an extent, but it never explains the arrival of the fittest. Any questions or comments so far? Mm-hmm. 
stagnant, you will have more errors than the others because you can strongly type and cuts it. But to put that back in evolution is totally different story. Absolutely. It's not the same thing that I would consider natural selection. So now what they also do But the problem that evolution has, and that's exactly right, they say that those are weeded out and that as time goes by and each uh, generation of animal is formed, the weakest one is gone, which is why we're humans today and we're no longer apes because natural selection plus genetic mutation equals a superior race. Problem is, there's many problems. First of all, there's still monkeys around today. If we are the evolutionary product of monkeys, there shouldn't be monkeys around, but there are. But there's also the fact that if we were to take natural selection and genetic mutation and apply it to all of the evolutionary theory in every single animal that's ever existed, there would only be one species left, especially if we can all trace back to a single living organism that we came from. Natural selection has no creative power. It's only to select the desired traits in that animal and to get rid of the weakest link. If you do that for long enough, there would be no population on earth. And like you said, with the animal kingdom, you do see it today to an extent. What evolution says is no, no, no. Natural selection plus genetic mutation creates the new life, the new form of life that comes and is better than the previous one. The natural selection that you're talking about is really uh, like you see with deer. The ones that grow the biggest antlers that fight each other they walk away with the doe, but that other deer is still around and it's still going to be able to make maybe next season or uh, whenever it has the chance to as it grows and matures. Natural selection is survival of the fittest in a nutshell, but it can't, still can't explain how they got to that point in the first place. It generally produces a net loss of information. Going back to the board, the survival of the fittest equals nine other call these species being eradicated so how does that work and how does that fit into the timeline it only preserves the traits which happen to have survival and or reproductive value given in an organism's current environment like you said change the environment is it still going to be the same story it's not natural selection eliminates traits that are to the demise of that species. In between these, those traits which are neutral to an organism's survival or reproduction are left to be degenerated by mutation. And that's where the genetic mutation comes into play. If you remember the example that I gave earlier with the game of poker, as successive games were played, Natural selection will be able to throw away the sets of cards that never win. But you can't play a game of poker with just a few cards. More winning hands would be dealt in that card game, but there would be a loss of information. There would be fewer cards. And there is no explanation for how the cards got onto the table in the first place. That is natural selection at the bottom line. Any questions or comments? Do you want to hear complicated? This is the explanation of genetic mutation. And I'm, we're not going to get into any of this tonight, but I'm glad you mentioned it's complicated. Okay, the supposed mechanism for adding, this is from uh, several science books. The supposed uh, mechanism for adding genetic information to the genome. Genome, sorry. Different kinds. Deletion, codon errors, duplication, translocation, no observed mutation ever adds new major genetic material. Objections. 150,000 years worth of human evolution. Flies with four wings, legs for antenna, no wings, no antenna, more eyes, less eyes. Mutations in bacteria, and the list goes on and on and on. You know what they do? They splice it down, they splice it down, they splice it down again, and they say, guess what? We found the answer, but we forgot it. 
and we have no idea what we're talking about. I've read so many pages of this stuff that it hurts my brain. You know why? Because they start talking about all these genomes and genetic mutations that happened in the past and how we came from this and that and how these flies evolved into this and look at this trait that happened in this species. And then they try and apply that to all of mankind and they say from the beginning, here's how we got here. And as you mentioned, creation is much simpler. And it is beautiful. It's That's pretty rare, isn't it? <laughs> so, but at the end of the day, they don't have to be accountable to anyone, and that's the source of it. Well, uh, as uh, what's his face, Bill Nye, the science guy, said. The hope and thrill of being an evolutionist is discovery. That's what he said. That's what gives him excitement. But what happens to the discovery when you die? What happens to everything when you die? Well, there's no more purpose if you take away Christ. Thank you for your attention. Appreciate your comments. Uh, and we will pick up looking at something that's a little less uh, hurtful on the brain next week. Thank you.